Good afternoon and welcome to our media availability. We are here today to give you an update on a couple of key pieces of administrative decisions that have been made in the last 24 hours. You'll be hearing in a moment from Gord Sebrick, who is the Deputy City Manager of City Operations, who will comment on the adjustments to turf maintenance for the summer, followed by Kim Petrin, who is the Branch Manager of Development Services, who will comment on the decision that Council made yesterday at a public hearing to eliminate parking minimums in the city. And afterwards, the Mayor is uh, available too to give his perspective and all three of them will answer your questions after we've heard from them. So let's get started with you, Gord. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Yesterday, administration provided an update to City Council on turf maintenance. We know that this has been an important topic for Edmontonians the past few weeks and we're taking action to address the concerns from residents. Earlier this year, service levels were reduced for maintenance in parks, sports fields, trails, and other city-owned green spaces this season due to financial impacts as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which required changes to staffing and service levels. As I mentioned last night, we have heard the frustration from the public about turf maintenance and the appearance of our green spaces. Based on this feedback, and after ensuring we can make these adjustments, we are improving our turf maintenance services responsibly and quickly. Starting in early July, all turf inventory will receive maintenance on a minimum of a 14-day mowing cycle. Premier sports fields and parks will continue to receive a minimum of weekly mowing. All turf inventory will receive one cycle of trimming around trees and objects per year and a continuation in weed control. To deliver at this level, we are immediately recalling 101 seasonal staff. This approach allows for a consistent service that ensures a reasonable level of maintenance across all turf types. It will take some time for our crews to catch up on deferred maintenance. However, Edmontonians should notice an increase in moving activity beginning in July. I would like to note that this is still a reduction in the maintenance or service level as compared to previous years. We anticipate conversations with Council on July 6th to continue this service level discussion. We want to thank Edmontonians for their understanding, patience and willingness to help as we navigate these service changes during times of fiscal restraint. We appreciate the community spirit some Edmontonians have shown. However, I would like to reiterate that we do not encourage Edmontonians to mow grass in city parks. We are hopeful that these adjusted service levels will help alleviate concerns as we continue to deliver turf maintenance across all services with a reduced workforce. Thank you and I'll now pass it over to Kim. Good afternoon everyone and thank you for being here. Yesterday was a really exciting day. Edmonton made history when it became the first Canadian municipality to eliminate parking minimums from its zoning bylaw in a move that we are referring to as open option parking. Open option parking will move us closer to achieving the vibrant, walkable, compact city that we have heard Edmontonians want through engagement of the Connect Edmonton and our draft city plan. Effective July 2nd, 2020, Developers, businesses, and landowners will now be able to choose how much parking on site to provide for their properties based on the lifestyle, the business, or activities. Under the new rules, accessible parking will continue to be provided at rates comparable to today, and bicycle parking requirements will be increased. Maximum parking requirements have also been retained downtown and expanded in transit-oriented development areas and main streets. Additionally, design requirements for both surface and underground parking facilities have been enhanced and opportunities created for businesses and homeowners to share parking with nearby properties. Developers, businesses and homeowners know their parking needs best and have an interest in ensuring they are met, making this approach more likely to result in the right amount of parking. 
Edmonton has a long history of allocating a disproportionate amount of parking to parking amenities, which has led to a greater than 50% oversupply of parking within our city. Allowing developments to share parking will enable more efficient use of the existing oversupply. While the change will be transformative, it will also be gradual. The new rules will come into effect as homes and businesses are developed or redeveloped in the decades ahead. With all that said, we know that there will be instances where a development may underprovide parking or an area may experience a high rate of redevelopment, which could lead to increased on-street parking pressure. This happened under the old rules as well. In these instances, we'll continue to work with neighborhoods as we do now, using tools such as paid parking, restricted parking, or residential parking programs to manage on-street parking where needed. A review of the city's overarching parking principles and our on-street parking management and enforcement objectives to ensure they align with the strategic goals in Connect Edmonton and the draft city plan is also underway. A report on this work will be presented to the Urban Planning Committee in the first part of 2021. The city will also be monitoring the impacts of shared parking and will report back to City Council in early 2021. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to the Mayor. Well, thanks uh, <clears throat> both to Gord and to Kim for those uh, technical details. A uh, ton of work uh, from both of your teams to bring that information forward, uh, particularly around the parking, but uh, a lot of adaptability around service levels and city operations too. So thank you both. Uh, as for turf maintenance specifically, there's really not much more I can add to what Gord has said about uh, technically what will happen. But I, I will say that we know it is frustrating for our community to see the longer grass and the dandelions. And we appreciate Edmontonians' patience as we work through these very challenging financial times for not just our city, but all local governments across the country. We know that this minor change in the service level will make a difference though, and we hope that people understand that our financial constraints as a result of COVID-19 still prevent us from restoring the full service levels that people are used to, but these increased mowing cycles will help. As for parking, I am really proud of the fact that our city council and, and our community is the first Canadian city to substantially cut red tape by removing parking minimums from our zoning bylaw. We are leading the way in passing a policy that contributes to changing the way our city will grow from here and what long-term sustainability looks like here in Edmonton. This policy removes barriers for new homes and for businesses and improves choice and flexibility in how businesses and homeowners meet their future parking needs. It also encourages alternative modes of transportation, which will help support the city's climate change, adaptation and resilience strategy. And like Kim said, during our city plan and Connect Edmonton engagement with Edmontonians, they told us, you told us, that you want a vibrant and walkable and compact city and policies like this will help deliver just that over time. But it is a win for urban policy that's being noticed nationally and beyond, and it does help contribute to building a healthy, affordable, and greener city. Obviously, um, uh, the other uh, work that continues uh, as the public hearing is continuing today, uh, more thoughtful feedback, uh, an update that I think that uh, we'll get to debating the motion on that, uh, and, and likely a number of amendments that I've uh, heard from different members of the council are being drafted right now. Um, based on the public feedback and, and, and likely based on a further question and answer from the police commission and the police service. Uh, that is uh, likely to happen. We haven't made the motion yet, but uh, uh, everything points to next Tuesday uh, at 9.30 a.m. Uh, is when a discussion on the motion, questions, and then eventually debate will begin. Whether it will finish that day, I don't know. There's a lot to talk about. Um, but, uh, but that's when the discussion will pick up after the public hearing concludes later today, um, after we will have heard from, I think, well over 150 Edmontonians uh, from a variety of perspectives. So uh, all that said, I'd be happy to take your questions, and if they get technical, I'm really grateful to have these folks here to supplement. So go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're uh, grateful, as always, for the interpretive support of Kevin Culp and Diane DeAndrade. 
and we're happy to take your questions. I'm going to go to Vinesh uh, from Global, first of all. Go ahead, Vinesh. Yeah, yes, Mayor. So uh, let's start with the, the public hearing here. Um, we are hearing from people who are very passionate and they put forward some very uh, thoughtful arguments, um, some arguments that are a bit more complicated. At the end of the day, Don, everyone's going to be satisfied with whatever decision comes. So what do you say to people about this process that will unfold after the public hearing? Um, and what can people expect at the end of the day? Well, it, uh, thank you for the question. And, and it is hard to predict where council will wind up on this. We've certainly heard um, a lot of uh, fairly broad feedback and acknowledgement that there is systemic racism uh, in Edmonton that that systemic racism uh, is a challenge for the city of Edmonton as an organization and that it is a challenge for the particular uh, wing of, of the city family that is policing. Um, because the Police Act uh, puts a lot of decision-making power about and oversight mechanisms for the police under the Police Commission, it's a little more complicated for City Council to weigh in. So people are focusing on our funding authority. They're also asking for a lot of other policy prescriptions uh, that are brightly within the realm of the Commission. So there'll be a lot of uh, uh, discussion uh, and dialogue with the Commission and with the service uh, about who's going to take leadership on what aspect of dealing with what I think everyone agrees uh, from the chair of the police commission to the police chief to I think most members of council though I think clearly each one of them needs, needs to speak up on this that there are broad issues of systemic racism um, that we didn't create personally but that we are in charge of working to resolve. Um, and I believe uh, our council's values on that over time have been in the right place. I think um, there are some opportunities to make some policy changes and look at our budget priorities arising from this. Uh, whatever we do will not please everybody. Uh, of, that is the one thing I can tell you for sure um, right now. And, and at this point, I, I think um, uh, I don't think that there will be an appetite uh, among members of council for abolition of policing outright. That That is a concept that, frankly, I, I, none of us that I'm aware of, certainly myself, hadn't even encountered um, uh, except in the last two weeks. So uh, I think that pace of, of change um, is is not likely to be uh, to find support within council, but I think a discussion about how we can smartly invest um, with a variety of frontline providers, including police, to support better community safety uh, outcomes, I think, uh, I think there's real openness to that and that it will be a, a very thoughtful discussion. That said, I don't want to go too far down that road because there's still uh, an additional couple of panels to hear from this afternoon. Did you have a second question? Yes, a follow-up. Uh, this relates to uh, the parking minimums. Yesterday in your comments, you mentioned, uh, you know, new versions of White Ave and things like that. You know, that's what we could see with these restrictions uh, removed. So I guess what can the city do to compel developers in greenfield communities to develop retail areas that are walkable, like White Ave, 124th Street, with these minimums? And what happens if that doesn't happen? He's not looking to compel um, a different form of development uh, per se. I think certainly by some of the moves we're making in the city plan and through the bus network redesign, for example, where we want to bring uh, nodes of higher order transit, whether it's LRT or whether it's super express bus service, to um, particular nodes and along corridors of higher density. Uh, that to the extent we can begin to build newer communities that way and retrofit older communities that way, that's how you start to create walkable critical mass uh, at those uh, intersections of those corridors with, um, with better transit. And then in some areas it's difficult to reverse engineer where you've got lots backing on, for example, but, but uh, where you purpose build new neighborhoods and design them to have those walkable town centers. A lot of the stuff we've approved over the last five to ten years lays that out on paper, it just hasn't been built yet because of the lag uh, from um, planning and approval time to construction time. So I think the city will start to look like that more in the future. 
and uh, businesses that are walkable destinations within old and new neighborhoods can rely less on uh, parking and um, and use the land more more effectively, be more affordable to their tenants, uh, whether they're residential or whether they're uh, commercial. But that also um, depends on there being great transit options and uh, great uh, walking and cycling infrastructure to give people, uh, as well as car sharing, as well as vehicle for hire, all of the different choices that people would need to over time uh, perhaps go from being two or three car households to one or two car households because a greater number of their household trips can be um, handled by different means and they're more uh, fun and vibrant, vibrant destinations within their own communities. So that's a very long market transformation exercise, but the planning direction has, has actually been um, towards that for several years and removing this parking barrier will have more immediate effects in the areas of the city that are already shaped that way uh, where the bones are already there but uh, but it certainly can apply not on a compulsory basis but on a, a market uh, enabled transformative basis over time uh, to the newer areas of the city and the medium age parts of the city as they redevelop around malls and other greyfield sites, for example, like imagine a Bonnie Dune redevelopment, for example, gets a lot more straightforward in a situation like this. So, so it will take time uh, and that's why it's a dramatic policy change, but in terms of what it actually means on the street, it will take uh, years and years and years for it to materially uh, change those, uh, those outcomes in ways that are visible to people, but it all adds up over, over time. I have a question submitted from Dustin Cook at the Journal, and it's for Gord. How is the reduced cost of this year's mowing program going to remain the same if 101 seasonal staff are being recalled immediately? Would this not impact the estimated savings? Gord. Uh, thanks for that question, Dustin. So uh, at the start of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, we did reduce service levels, and we presented a budget uh, as part of the SOBA. And with that, we had identified uh, resource requirements and we intended to fill those resource requirements through uh, redeployments of some uh, of the staff that had been laid off. We were able to uh, redeploy a number of staff, but we weren't able to reach the targeted levels uh, that we had identified. So as a result, we were uh, not uh, expending what we had anticipated. So uh, trying to be agile and understanding our financial position, we were able to look at potentially uh, recalling staff and that's the point we're at now is that we're able to recall staff and stay within the existing budget. So the dollars were there, the people were not, now they will be. We're going to go next to Jeremy in the room. Uh, sure, a uh, question for the mayor here, uh, just more on this uh, uh, parking requirement here. Uh, I heard you as you were walking in. A little bit of bragging about uh, some envy going on from other parts of the country about this change. Why, why is Edmonton first and why is it important that Edmonton's first do this? Well, um, some of the commentary that I saw from uh, some American uh, commentators uh, who were responding to some Canadian urbanists from Toronto and from Vancouver who've been paying attention to this, um, uh, who are thought leaders uh, in, in North America on many of these issues, have been calling for this move for a long time. And so it is significant that Edmonton is the first major Canadian city to go in this direction. Um, they've been uh, tracking that and, and amplifying that. And so uh, within the fairly small bubble of Canadian urbanists, there's a lot of excitement around this. Um, but uh, that has then led to a second a kind of wave of, of conversation about a lot of the other uh, very progressive urban policies that we've implemented in our zoning bylaw around um, uh, opportunities to develop more small and medium rise um, uh, duplexes, garden suites, you know, we're, we're uh, as well as um, uh, row housing and, and low rise apartments and um, one of the constraints for a lot of those always was, well, that's great, but if you still have to provide all this parking to go with them, you don't actually have enough room to do it and the costs become prohibitive again, even if there's an LRT station next door. And so we spent a lot of time trying to say, well, if you're really close to an LRT, maybe you can vary the rule this way, or if you're in a legacy historical area, you can vary the rule that way. So we created extra red tape to try to vary the red tape and we just cut it all. 
And so that is a significant move from a regulatory point of view, from a policy point of view, and it is reverberating certainly across the country and a little bit into the United States that people are saying, you know, this, this uh, a fairly spread out northern city is taking this ambitious position. Why can't we in city X? Um, and so... Uh, so it's not just this decision, it's uh, for those who've been watching closely, some of those external commentators, the sum total of really um, uh, ambitious urban policy to be able to grow up more and grow out more densely and in a more connected and, and transit enabled way, for example. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the LRT conversations we keep having are so critical because those are the backbones that connect these nodes of density and, and vibrant communities. Um, and it doesn't make sense to have a ton of parking around those areas. And if that allows, uh, if reducing the parking requirement makes the unit more competitive and affordable with the suburbs and car dependency, you've actually got systemic change happening to enable uh, more denser, vibrant, walkable, um, greener communities, which has been our strategic plan for, for many years. This is a key implementation step towards that. And urbanists know that this is one of the essential ingredients to making the affordability of this right. And if you can get the economics and the affordability right, then it can take off and tip over. So we've been putting a lot of pieces in, uh, in place to uh, support that increased density and that increased vibrancy and that increased choice, both in the suburbs and in the redeveloping um, parts of the city. And, and that is starting to get noticed as a, as a sum total of work. Second question. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned um, it'll take kind of years and years for people to actually see the ramifications of, of this decision but are you know are you aware of many companies out there right now who are kind of chomping at the bit to, to do this so so the sum total of this in terms of what it will mean for car dependency over the long term affordability of of real estate over the long term uh, to add up to s sort of overall system change that that will take time but there are um, uh, builders uh, from mom and pop builders uh, to through to large real estate companies who've been waiting to see where we go with this decision because it will affect investment decisions that they are making right now. Um, and if it makes the difference on you know a large transit oriented development going ahead, uh, you know that can be hundreds of millions of dollars worth of economic impact. And again, it's why those those LRT projects in particular are not just uh, big infrastructure projects in and of themselves, but what they can unlock as long as we have the regulatory framework right could be uh, even more significant from an economic development and job creation point of view, um, as well as supporting all of our city building goals. So there are there are, uh, many many builders and investors who've been waiting to see where we go with this, and it will enable them to be faster and more bold with their investments so job creation it should support right away as a as a cut red tape um, economic stimulus measure but in terms of overall patterns of how we live and, and move uh, in the city um, in ways that that will sort of show up over time in the statistics of how many people are taking transit how many people are driving how many people are walking how many people are biking that will take years and years and years to really substantially change as a result of this but it, it'll start right away with development permit applications that can come in this morning um, and and ask for something different than what we had rigidly required before and not have to spend months and months and months trying to make the case for a deviation from a set of rules that's really 50-year-old thinking that we did away with yesterday. Thank you, Jeremy. We're going to go next to Scott from 630 Chad. Go ahead, please, Scott. First question, uh, I'll have two. One for the mayor, one for Gord. Uh, for the mayor, uh, honoring the embargo, and we'll honor the embargo ourselves by not broadcasting or reporting your answer until the embargo is lifted. Uh, what's your take on the UCP elections bill? Streaming this uh, conference, so I'm not really sure uh, how to watching how to how to respond to <laughs> that. Um, uh, so the changes to the local authorities elections act level for me, even a 30,000 foot level uh, take on where they're going with this 
Well, um, I, I did have a good conversation with the minister yesterday uh, who was able to reassure me that uh, a number of our suggestions um, that, that council submitted uh, have been incorporated and that they were listening um, to, to our feedback. Uh, so we'll wait to see what the final draft of the legislation looks like. Uh, uh, to see where all of that lands, but uh, his openness to our feedback was um, was refreshing. The um, there are still some elements of the conversation around uh, third party advertising, which uh, I, I need to know more about. I, I still have real concerns about um, how that could distort um, uh, campaigns of that ought to be about local issues uh, and and I also flagged concerns for him about that that are consistent with the uh, Alberta urban municipalities overwhelming position in a, a meeting we held last week where 95 percent of the delegates on the call uh, from urban communities large and small across Alberta said we really want to keep our local elections about local issues and and keep the uh, the referendum questions that are provincial and federal um, out of our local democracies. Uh, provinces uh, did release legislation yesterday that gives them the right to put whatever question they want on on uh, our ballots. Uh, so that is their decision. Um, our position is, is clear on it. But uh, to the extent that those referendum questions and third party advertising happening at the same time as our local elections potentially undermine public focus on um, and candidate focus on the issues, because I guarantee you, you go uh, knock door to door and, and the people setting the question for the referendum, you know, voters will want to say, where do you stand on this matter of provincial and federal jurisdiction when you are running for municipal office? And, and um, that just takes away from the focus on local issues, in my view. I, the government has a different view, um, but 95% uh, of municipal delegates last week said, uh, we have a different view. So, so uh, we'll wait to see what the exact uh, wording of the legislation is around the third party advertising. I, uh, our council continues to have huge concerns about that, um, but we'll see what the, the black letter law says. But they did listen to us on some of the other uh, more administrative provisions and, uh, and keeping the partisan angle out and, uh, and um, keeping corporate and union money out of uh, the campaigns. And so those are positive steps that I, uh, I do acknowledge. Scott, go ahead with your question Thank for you. Gord. Thank you for that. And, and for the grass cutting question, uh, isn't the horse out of the barn now? What's the worry that we have had so much damage from the candy lines going to seed and they've spread and uh, well, the damage has already happened. What, what's your response to that? So, uh, Scott, that's a good question. I, I think we've uh, been uh, behind for about uh, eight weeks now, uh, but we're not at a point where uh, we can't catch up. We do know that, uh, of course, uh, when dandelions go to seed, uh, they will uh, reseed, but however, our, our increased mowing will help us uh, combat that next wave and a lot of the the downhill lines are certainly weather dependent dependent on what we have for growing conditions so uh, typically the earlier growing season uh, the first one of the year is is the more severe one so with the uh, increased resources we think we'll be able to catch up and and make a good uh, dent in terms of uh, combating both downhill lines as well as the increased height of the grass and lastly, we'll go to Natasha. Thanks for waiting, Natasha. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks. I think there's a follow-up to the turf maintenance as well for Gord. I'm just trying to get a better sense of where the focus might be. Uh, we did a story on, you know, uh, citizens taking the mowing into their own hands uh, and mainly to give their kids, you know, uh, room to play soccer, for example, or, or ball. So is there going to be like kind of a priority list for this? So we, good question. We do have a prioritization of all the different levels of sports fields and that information uh, was presented yesterday in detail. But uh, overall, basically, there are a number of locations that actually weren't going to get any mowing this year. So certainly those will be some of the first ones that we're attending to, those that haven't had any mowing at all. We are maintaining the existing level of service for the premier sports field. So where residents and citizens can uh, see a difference are those areas that haven't had any attention to date. And those will be the ones that uh, you'll likely see the first and biggest impacts on.
Tasha, did you have a follow-up question? Okay. Yes, please. Go ahead. And, and Gord, you had mentioned uh, you at the at the end of your statement that you were urging people not to not to mow themselves, or not mow them, not to take mowing into their own hands. Can you elaborate on maybe some safety issues that that come to mind for, with, when people are doing that on these public sports fields? So. Definitely, we can uh, allude to that. Uh, we have, uh, our staff have a significant level of training on a number of different aspects, uh, and we do have specific PPE as well as procedures to ensure the safety of uh, our employees when they're doing the work. So uh, most citizens don't have that level of training and in some cases uh, may or may not be using PPE. So, uh, you know, for those reasons, we want to make sure that citizens are safe. We really appreciate their enthusiasm trying to help out, but we want to make sure that it's done in a safe way. And we have uh, staff that have the training, the, uh, the personal protective equipment, as well as the procedures uh, that allow us to go into some of these locations where there may be some hazards that may or may not be uh, seen. So uh, really, it's about the safety of our residents. But we really, uh, again, Thank them for their enthusiasm, but we think we can take over from this point with the increased service levels and resources. Thanks, Natasha. We have time for one last question from anyone who's online with us. Yeah, if I could ask a question of Kim, please. Um, if you could just expand, you know, we've seen already situations where there have been overflow parking and people parking in residential areas like in Ritchie, for example. Um, so what's the plan going forward? You know, you, you kind of mentioned it. Um, you know, are we going to see an expansion of like e-park zones? Um, and how, how is this going to be monitored and, and policed for lack of a, uh, a better term? Uh, so the opportunity for shared parking really enables businesses and residents to make better use of the supply that's there. We recognize there will be some challenges um, and we will use the tools that we have to address those challenges that include time restricted parking, paid parking, uh, as well as our parking permit program. And I mentioned earlier that we're modernizing the parking permit program and we'll have a report for Urban Planning Committee in the first quarter of uh, 2021. Are we going to see new e-park zones in areas where we traditionally don't see them now, right now? That's definitely one of the tools that we can use to, to uh, uh, address the issue. Thanks, Vinesh. And Jeremy has one last question in the room, and then we'll wrap it up. Sure. It was just to follow up to Destiny's question on the, on the mowing and the, the costs. I, I'm just hoping, Gordon, you could kind of dumb it down a little further for us. What, what, uh, how is it possible that, that hiring these people back uh, or hiring these people, 101 people, is still within that same budget amount. So basically, uh, in the uh, supplementary operating budget adjustment, we identified a service level and an associated cost with that service level, and that was based on uh, providing a number of staff to do that work, and that was largely going to be fulfilled through redeployments. We weren't able to get that level of redeployment that we anticipated, so we didn't expand all of the, the money that we had identified. So now we have opportunity to recall uh, staff because we purposely had not been recalling staff in order to achieve those financial savings. Thanks, Jeremy. And thanks, everyone. We will speak with you soon. Really appreciate you being with us. And thanks to the participants. Thank you all. Thank you.